Good morning, Spring Valley United Methodist Church. Glad to see you. Yeah, that's great. My name is Brock Johnson. I'm the interim music director here, and I just want to welcome you to our worship service. I want to welcome you here in the congregation as well as online. It's good to have you. We have a bulletin here with our order of worship, and on the inside, there is a card that you can fill out with prayer requests or for your attendance, and you can drop those in the offering plate. I hope you enjoy your worship service. And next we have the call to worship, led by Rose Denny and Nico. Or no, I'm sorry, Sam and Nico. <laughs> Stand up for the call to worship. From the beginning, God has created something from nothing. God created the light out of the darkness. From the days of Moses, God gave prov provisions. From feeding of, of the 5,000 until now. God gives us more than we can imagine. Now let's do the unison prayer, okay? All right. Eternal, Eternal God, God, you can call us out of scarcity into abundance. Not unlike the disciples, we often answer this call with fear and anxiety, trying to hold on when there is plenty to go around. Give us courage to live selflessly in community. Give us open hearts and open eyes to see the miracle you are working every day. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing our opening hymn, hymn number 400, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. We have a few announcements. There is a lots of announcements on the back of your bulletin, so pay attention to that. But a couple of things of note. Pastor Frank has a study on Tuesday evenings at 6.30. It's online and in person. You can email him if you need the link for that. The most important thing on this list is that there's a church brunch next Sunday in Wesley Hall. So make sure you bring something good to share with friends. 
Has to be good, though. If not, I'll let you know. <laughs> and we're also starting a new sermon series called Come to the Table, which begins on September 10th through October 1st. Something to look forward to. Also, there is youth game night next Sunday, so youth get super excited about playing games. And also, don't forget about practicing your ukulele after we have our rehearsals in the morning. <laughs> you know who you are. <laughs> yeah, that's all. Thank you, Brooke. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's so great to be with all of you. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Welcome to worship. My name is Rosdani Ortiz, your associate pastor here at your beloved church, Spring Valley United Methodist. And it is the time to come together in prayer. A time we pray to feel God's presence among us, to experience the Holy Spirit, to ask God for his intervention in our struggles. A time to lift up our gratefulness and celebrations. Because as the word of God says, when two or more are gathered in my name, I will be there. Amen? Amen. So brothers and sisters, God is listening. So let us begin with some silence as we lift up our own prayer requests. Then we will continue to pray, but together as a church. And before we begin, I have a couple of special prayer requests for all of you. First of all, today is the last day for our family, Russ Murphy. They're going to be moving into another place. And we're just grateful for all that they have done here at church, all their time that they have been here with us as a family. And I want to invite you that at the end of worship, there will be outside in the lobby. Please go by them and say, you know, how grateful you are for them and wish them good luck in their next adventure. And I ask Mac, you know, every time you come by, you know, to Dallas, visit us, right? So I, I hope that he has great memories from our church, from our church family, and we feel sure we'll miss you, especially Common Ground Worship that enjoy so much your gifts through the worship. So thank you, Mac, and all your children, and your spouse, everybody. So please keep them in your prayers. Also, I want to invite you to pray uh, from two members of our church who sadly passed away, Raph Detwiller and Betty Garrett. They are from the Beacon Sunday School class. So I invite you as well to pray for them, for their family, for the Beacon Sunday School class because they are also are grieving their passing. So let us begin with prayer. God, some of us may have come this morning with heavy hearts. Bring comfort. You know us, God. As your word says, since we were in our mother's womb. Because you know us better than ourselves. Please help us. Guide us. Mold us into the people that you want us to be. We may have some cracks, but you continue to mold us. You continue to help us to pick up the pieces and put ourselves back together. Our faith is the glue that keeps us those broken pieces to make together and make us whole in you. No matter the scars we may have, you continue to love us. No matter the things we continue to do, you continue to forgive us. Guide us, God, to become better. Guide us, God, to, to remove all those things that are not coming from you. 
to be better in those things that make us, keep us away from you. Help us, God. Help us. God, help us that we can continue to share your good news in pain and joy. In suffering and happiness, we can continue to show our love for you to our others. God, help us see that in everything we experience, the good and the bad, you are there with us. Please help us understand that everything we share is an opportunity to get to know you more and continue to grow in our faith in our relationship with you. And as our faith grows, as our faith grows, it will continue to hold our hearts stronger when we hear and see many horrible things happening around us. Things that sometimes we wish you could take away. Things that we often want to never happen, never existed. We pray for the continued wildfires. We especially pray for Louisiana. We pray for another natural disaster, Hurricane Idalia, that affected the areas of Florida. That also for the impact it had over South Georgia and Carolinas. God, make your presence be known to all of those affected by these natural disasters. Let them feel loved. Let them feel supported by their neighbors. And help us, God, to support them not only in prayer, but in the many ways that you show us how to support our neighbors when they are going through something impactful in their lives. We also pray for the Ross Murphy family as they're doing this transition. Bless them, God. Bless their family. And may they continue to share the gifts that you gave them into the next family church that they're going to be part of. We pray as well for the families of Ralph Del Wheeler and Betty Garrett. Be with them in this painful time. Be with them, God, as they grieve and as they move forward in this life without their loved ones. Lastly, God, listen to each of our hearts here in this place. Thank you, God, for listening. Thank you, God, for your presence among us, for responding in the many ways that you manifest. We lift all our prayers knowing, God, that you love us. And we conclude by praying the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our, our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. Hey, my name is Pastor Frank. Uh, and I'm so glad to see everybody here. Uh, I might get in trouble with this. Can I just welcome? Pastor Rose Danny's sisters are here. Uh, they came to visit Rose Danny and Louise Shore, but they're really here for baby Daniel and the girls. Of course they are. But would y'all just welcome them? I'm so glad that, that they're here. Thanks for being here. Awesome. Uh, all right. So our, our text morning, we're wrapping up a series that we've been calling uh, Bless This Neighborhood. And I know that several of you have been filling out bingo cards and you're eagerly anticipating a prize. <laughs> Prizes will be awarded next Sunday in worship. So if you have not filled out your card yet, or if you have no idea what I'm talking about, the bingo cards are at the back. Herb, raise your hand. Wave at us. Just wave at us, Herb. They're right behind Herb. He's right there. 
There's bingo cards on that side. And on the other side are little welcome cards that you can just leave for people as you're blessing them. So keep track. And if you have three in a row, four in a row, or the whole card, you get a prize next Sunday. So there's still time. Okay, our, so we're wrapping up our series, and our text today is Luke chapter 19, verses 41 through 44. It'll be up there on the screen. You can read along with me on a phone that you have with you, or in a Bible, or if you'd like to just kind of listen, center yourself, close your eyes, and imagine the scene. This is Jesus' uh, prayers over Jerusalem after he's entered the city on Palm Sunday. Listen to the word of God, Luke 19, 41. As Jesus came to the city and observed it, he wept over it. He said, if only you knew on this day the things that lead to peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. The time will come when your enemies will build fortifications around you, fortifications around you. They will encircle you and attack you from all sides. They will crush you completely, you and the people within you. They won't leave one stone on top of another within you because you did not recognize the time of your gracious visit from God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks uh, for the gift of this day and for the precious gift of life. We pause for a moment to center ourselves on this day of rest, on a, as we're looking at a holiday tomorrow, another day meant to be restful. We pause in the quiet, in the stillness, in this space, but also in our homes or wherever we're worshiping online. Help us to just be present in this particular moment. We breathe in your Holy Spirit. We breathe out your peace. Help us to worship you. Open our eyes and our hearts and our minds, our spirits, to the message that you would have us to hear that we may be inspired to be sent out as your ambassadors into the community. And Lord, I pray that as I speak this morning, your word may be heard through me, if not because of me, then in spite of me. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. So last fall, last November, I had the privilege of visiting the Holy Land with a group of another 40 or so pastors uh, from my district uh, from which I came. And we spent about 10 days there. And y'all, I'm available. If your Sunday schools want to come, want to invite me to come and tell stories about the trip, I would love to do that. I've got all kinds of pictures, all kinds of stories. Now you might be thinking, enough of him in worship that I can't have anymore. And that's fine too. But if if you'd be interested in that, I'd I'd be glad to come and do that. But I'm thinking today about the time that we spent on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. You've probably seen on the news or whatever the wall uh, of the temple, uh, and you've seen pilgrims praying at that wall uh, for, for centuries. It's been a place where people can come, people of many different faiths can come to pray. Uh, sometimes people are touching the wall Sometimes, like me, there are pilgrims who have written prayers on little strips of paper, and we're trying to kind of squeeze past people to put them into crevices in the wall. Sometimes there are people uh, praying right at the wall with books of psalms, and they're praying in rhythm. They're singing as they're praying in rhythm. Sometimes they're just kind of seated off at the distance and taking in the whole scene. It's an amazing sight. Jerusalem is a holy city for Christians, Muslims, and Jews. And the temple is a holy site for all of those faiths. Uh, You know that Solomon built the original temple, right? 
King David died. His son Solomon became the next king. David had instituted Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, but it was Solomon's task to build the temple. And Solomon was uh, an over-the-top type person, right? And so, uh, the, hey, the expense account was limitless. So he just brought in all this stuff. The temple that Solomon built was grand. It was magnificent. It was ornate. It was so over the top. It was gorgeous. And it became the, the, the place where they believed that God lived. You know, God had been traveling with them throughout the wilderness, throughout the Exodus story, in a tent that they would, you know, take down at the end of the day, roll it up, come to the next place, unroll it. But now they had a permanent structure. And that proud temple stood for, for centuries until it was destroyed by foreign invaders in the year 587 before the Common Era. The prophet Jeremiah, if you read the book of Jeremiah in the Old Testament, it's about 50 chapters of a prophet telling people, unless you change your ways, we're going to lose everything that we hold so dear. We're going to lose the temple. We're going to lose the city of Jerusalem. If we don't align ourselves with God's will, if we don't act and look like the things that God wants us to do, all that we hold sacred will be lost. Jeremiah did this for decades. And people treated him as people often treat prophets who are preaching doom and gloom in times of prosperity. They thought he was a crazy person, right? They locked him up in the stockades in the center of town. People threw rotten tomatoes at him. They made fun of him. But years later, Jeremiah lived to witness the truth happened. He saw the foreign armies come. He saw the temple of the Lord destroyed. He saw the people taken into captivity in a foreign land. And for 70 years, the Israelites were forced to live in Babylon away from Israel, away from Jerusalem. And then over time, over those generations, the Lord gave a vision to two different people, one whose name was Nehemiah, and one whose name was Ezra. There are two books in the Old Testament. They're right next door to each other, Ezra and Nehemiah. At one time, they were one book. Ezra was a priest of the Lord. Nehemiah was cupbearer to the king of Babylon, whose name was Nebuchadnezzar. And Nehemiah one day was really depressed, and the king noticed it, because Nehemiah was really just normally this super energetic guy. What's going on with you? You're, you're, you're depressing me. What's wrong? And he said, I have this vision of the holy city of Jerusalem. And, 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 and my vision is to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls around the city. Because no one has seen them in 70 years. I don't know what's happened to the holy city. And the king gave him permission to go back and rebuild those walls. Nehemiah is a great book on biblical leadership, if you're ever curious about how leaders in the Bible, or how we can learn as leaders to lead from faith. Ezra, at the same time, had a vision to build a second temple. But this is in a time of exile and foreign occupation, not the blank check time of Solomon. And so Ezra's capital campaign was much less ambitious than Solomon's was, right? But they laid foundation upon the same place the previous temple was, and they built the temple. And at that time, the people were allowed to return to Jerusalem and resettle in, in Israel. And there's this great moment where the, the new temple is consecrated, and they've invited all of the Israelites to Jerusalem to come and they're singing prayers, and they're celebrating. And there's this moment, this beautiful moment, where both generations of people are worshiping together. Uh, the old timers, who had been raised in Jerusalem, and remembered Solomon's temple, right? Remember I said it was glorious, it was ambitious, it was over the top. The, the narrator of the story of Ezra tells us 
that those people were weeping because the new temple was smaller, not as ornate, not as beautiful. They were grieving what had been and what was now present reality. At the same time, there were people who were born in captivity who had never seen the previous temple. And those people were singing prayers and crying as well, but the narrator tells us they were crying out of worship because they now had a home. They now had a temple where they could worship in. And the narrator has this great line that from a distance, you couldn't tell who was crying mourning the previous temple and who was crying celebrating the new temple. It was one voice crying together. So many amazing things to talk about there with, with worship and unity, but that's another thing. By the way, coincidentally, we're moving to 10 o'clock in a couple weeks. Next, uh, moving on. Uh, so that temple stood for several centuries again, and then Herod became powerful, became king. Okay, there's a handheld somewhere, right? Anyway, so Herod, can we turn, do we have it? Okay, I'll, I'll just do this. Herod, Herod became king. Herod instituted a capital campaign. Herod expanded the temple to what it was even bigger than Solomon's temple was. Herod expanded the area around Jerusalem around the temple in Jerusalem, so that the, the space around the temple was bigger. This is the temple that Jesus came to in our text in Luke, the third temple. So Jesus enters the city of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, right? And the, and the crowds surround Jesus, and they're waving their palm branches everywhere, and they're all shouting, Hosanna to the new king who's come. And immediately following that parade, the procession stops at the temple, and it's there that Jesus laments over Jerusalem. Because Jesus knows the whole story. Jesus knows what's happened in Jerusalem before to prophets like Jeremiah, who were faithful to the mission the Lord had given them and who suffered as a result of it. Jesus is also well aware the same fate awaits him in just a few days' time. Jesus knows full well that the same people who cheered him on, blessed is the king who's come, will also cry for him to be arrested and executed in just four or five days. And all of this story overwhelms him and he begins to weep, crying over the city. So there's been a move in our series. It started with a random encounter in the middle of nowhere between a person who had been hurt and a Samaritan who offered help. And Jesus said, the neighbor is the one who has compassion for the other who is suffering. And then we moved from there, from the, from the wilderness into the synagogue where Jesus healed a woman who had been bent over for years and restored her to standing up straight disrupting worship and breaking the rules of the Sabbath. And the leaders went crazy. Oh, we don't do healings on, in worship. Come during office hours for that. What? And then last week, Jesus goes into Gentile territory to a person who had been possessed by thousands of demons and heals that person. And the people in the community who've now witnessed the power of God say to him, thanks, but no thanks. Get back on the boat and go back to where you come from. And now Jesus has entered into the city of Jerusalem, which isn't just a small town in the middle of nowhere, which isn't just a holy place for Jews. It's holy for Christians. It's holy for Muslims. It's holy, it's holy for all persons of faith. The temple is a holy place that anybody can come and pray at regardless of their religious affiliation. And it's in this space that Jesus' heart breaks for the stubbornness 
of humanity. Because throughout his ministry, he tried to teach people and he met resistance, often from people in the worshiping community itself. Because throughout not just his ministry, but the ministry of the prophets, people resisted the message of the Lord. They refused to change their hearts to align with God's heart, even when the consequence was clearly articulated. And this grief overwhelms Jesus. Y'all don't get me started on stuff like I love the God of the New Testament, not the God of the Old Testament. It's one God. If you want to get me riled up in, in Bible study, somebody raise their hand and make that point. <laughs> we'll have a church meeting in that, right? <laughs> the Old Testament is filled of stories of God's heart breaking, of the weeping of God at the lack of faith of God's people. It's the same heart embodied in Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul, in one of his letters, even says to the church, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Jesus' heart breaks over our lack of faithfulness. So you think about what breaks Jesus' heart today. And you think about institutional poverty. Or you think about our refusal to recognize people of other races and languages as, as equals. You think about our refusal to see every person as a neighbor made in the image of God every time it breaks Jesus' heart. Think about the, the institutional things that are related to violence in our communities. that our students and teachers live under the threat of violence and our leaders refuse to do anything about it. The next shooting breaks the heart of God. This grief overwhelms God. And then we have to ask, what are we going to do about it, right? If we're, if we're called to be missionaries, if we're called to be sent out into the community, but we're not willing to recognize our brokenness and repent of it and accept the freedom that Christ gives for a new life. How can we faithfully be an ambassador if we're not willing to be changed ourselves? Are y'all, anybody hearing me this morning? I don't know. I'm seeing lots of blank stares. It's okay. It's okay. How can we be faithful to the mission we've been called to if we're not willing to be transformed ourselves first. We can't transform the neighborhood if we're not willing to be transformed, yeah? So what I'm asking today is to think about how how can we have broken hearts for the needs around us to join in with Christ in weeping for the brokenness of humanity, but also what are we going to do about it ourselves to take next steps toward healing and restoration. It just so happens that today's a communion Sunday. Isn't that great? When we come to this altar here in a few moments, we have an opportunity to partake in this sacrament. Y'all, this is what God does in communion. God takes something as ordinary as bread and grape juice and transforms them into nourishment for our souls that gives us energy. God takes what's ordinary that can be bought at a grocery store and makes it extraordinary by the power of the Holy Spirit to transform us so that when we partake up here in a second, the real presence of Christ is with us. Amen? That's what happens here. It's not just something we do out of habit. It's something we do because we are starving and we need nourishment. And the Lord gives this to us. Now, in our tradition, we say this is an open table. 
We said you don't have to be United Methodist. You don't have to have a Spring Valley United Methodist membership card to come to the table. It's the Lord's table. And that's true. We're all invited to come. That being said, there are expectations for people who come. When we use our traditional liturgy, it says, Christ our Lord invites to this table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and who seek to live in peace with one another. Love Christ, repent of our sin. Sin literally means messing the mark. You think about shooting a target and missing it. That's what sin is. And reconciling with our neighbor. Love Christ, repent of sin, seek reconciliation. That's the expectation for communion. We're all welcome to come. The expectation is we're working on things. Jesus even said somewhere else, if you have a conflict with a brother or sister in the church, you know what he said? Go ahead and bring your offering to the table. I love this. Leave it at the table, but then go and seek reconciliation with your neighbor first. Be reconciled and then come back and bring your gift. What happens at communion is it's an opportunity to be reconciled to one another here. So I'm thinking about all these things. And I'm doing these, uh, I'm reading about spiritual direction a little bit. And I came across this thing. I wanna, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna talk to you about a couple things. The first is that when we begin to do spiritual work in our lives, we have to embrace two truths that are empirical. I don't know. They're, they're a perfect truth. I forgot the word I was supposed to use. They're undeniable truths, okay? You have to embrace both of them. And the first is God loves each of us unconditionally. God is love, right? The Scripture says that. But do we know that? Do we own that? How many of us at a spiritual level still struggle with being worthy of God's love. You don't have to raise your hand, but perhaps someone taught you that sometime. It might have even been someone like me in the church. Let me tell you, it's false. God's love is for everybody. It's eternal, and it's driven by grace, which means it's free. God's love can't be bought. It can't be earned. It certainly is not deserved. It's offered. That's truth number one. God loves each of us. There's nothing we can do. There's nothing we have done that can separate us from that love. Yeah? Okay, good. Here's the second one. Every one of us is broken has sinned, and is in need of God's grace and forgiveness. Yeah? Every one of us is broken, needs to be reconciled to God and one another. These are two universal truths. God loves us, and we are broken and need, and need forgiveness. Those things work together. Everything else in our spiritual life is built on those two truths. Right? We expect those things, we can move forward. So then I'm thinking, how do, we, how do we invite people to experience that? And then I thought about this little dude. This is anointing oil. It's olive oil. It's scented olive oil. I don't know, it's rosemary or something. Frankincense and myrrh. It's a quarter ounce of olive oil. It's not magic. I didn't buy it from some train station that gave me lots of promises about it, all right? It's just olive oil. But anointing with oil is an ancient spiritual practice, not limited to just Christians or Jews. 
Almost every world religion in some way practices anointing with oil. So, the book of James, one of my favorite books. This is not the right thing. Here we go. Y'all are just getting used to this stuff. This is Pastor Frank. This is, this is, this is me, right? It's just me. Uh, the book of James says this in chapter 5. Not that. Good Lord. <laughs> this is what James says. I'm actually reading it from the scripture, I promise. If any of you are suffering, they should pray. If any of you are happy, they should sing. If any of you are sick, they should call for the elders of the church. That's me. And the elders should pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. Prayer that comes from faith will heal the sick, for the Lord will restore them to health. And if they've sinned, they will be forgiven. For this reason, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. Remember, reconciliation is part of this. That you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous person is powerful in what it can achieve. So I'm going to offer you an invitation. Pastor Rose Day is going to come up here, and she's going to give an invitation to the Lord's Supper. I'm going to give a second invitation to come to the altar after you've received the Lord's Supper to receive a drop of oil in the form of a cross on your forehead. Healing is power that belongs only to God, not to me, not to any other person. People can be healed and still continue in sickness. People can be healed and still die because they've experienced the peace of the Lord in their lives. So my invitation, and you don't have to accept it, if this is totally new to you and it's uncomfortable, that's totally fine. Please don't feel pressured in any way. But the invitation is, after we got, we'll have intention, right? Herb will, and the ushers will lead us forward down the center aisle. The choir will come first. After we've received the Lord's Supper, if you would like to come to the altar to pray, you may do that and stay as long as you like. If you would like to receive anointing with oil, seeking healing for anything, right? Physical, spiritual, mental, whatever, anything, conflict, anything going on in your life. If you would like to receive oil as you're kneeling at the altar, come with your hands cupped like this. Then I'll know to come to you. I'll take a little drop of oil, I'll put it in the form of a cross on your forehead, and I'll say, I anoint you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Stay as long as you like. If you're uncomfortable coming forward and you'd still like to receive oil, find me after worship. I'd be glad to anoint you then. If you would like to take a step further and have me pray with you about whatever thing, I'd be glad to do that. Let me know after worship, and we'll do that. All of this is optional. It's all a way of responding to the Lord whose heart breaks for us in our brokenness. So I invite you as we come to know the heart of Jesus, to know the, the tears that the Lord weeps over the brokenness of humanity, to embrace the love offered and the grace. We can't earn it. We are worthy of it. It's a divine gift by the one who it made a whole world out of love. And if you'd like to respond after receiving the sacrament, receive the gift of oil, come to the, ta the altar table with your hands cupped in this fashion. Uh, let's, let's have a word of prayer before our invitation to the table. Lord Jesus Christ, we know that you wept over Jerusalem, the holy city, a city that is inclusive of all faiths and all peoples, so many people around the world consider that place holy. And Lord, we know that you pray over the brokenness of our society in this place and the brokenness of each life here. 
We pray, Lord, that you would be an agent of healing in our lives. That we would know the power of the Holy Spirit. And that we would respond to the Spirit as you lead us. Thank you, Lord, for loving us this much. Help us to embrace that love. To also know that we're broken and in need of healing and restoration, God. You love us. You call us. You send us. You do it all for the sake of the community around us. We want to bless our neighborhood. We want to embody your love. We love you. You love us. And for this and so many other things, we are grateful. In the name of Christ, we pray. As followers of Jesus, we are called to feed those around us, just like the disciples. We've seen in, in that God can do abundantly. Amen? And as we give this morning, let us give joyfully and without fear, knowing that God takes what we give and multiplies it in unexpected ways. Now we invite the ushers to come forward as we all join in prayer. Pray with me. God of abundance, take our offerings and increase them, just like you did with the loaves and fish. Show us new and creative ways to use these gifts to expand your table into our city. Give us wisdom as we reach out to those around us for your good and your glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Wow, thank you, Pastor. We're going to do a song uh, from the contemporary side of the service. Uh, this song was contemporary, written by uh, Chris Christofferston. Why me, Lord? What have I ever done to deserve even one of the blessings I've known? Why me, Lord? What did I ever do was worth love from you and the kindness you've shown? Lord, help me, Jesus, I wasted it, so help me, Jesus, I know what I am. Now that I know that I need it, just so help me, Jesus, my soul's in your hands. Try me, Lord. If you think there's a way that I can repay what I've taken from you, maybe, Lord, I could show someone else what I went through myself on my way back to you. Lord, help me, Jesus. I wasted it, so help me, Jesus, I know what I am. Now that I know that I need it, just so help me, Jesus, my soul's in your hands. Lord, help me, Jesus, I wasted it. So help me, Jesus, I know what I am. Now that I know that I need it, so help me, Jesus, my soul's in your hands. 
Jesus, my soul's in your hand. Mac, we're going to miss you, man. Pastor Frank invited us to come to the table today. The Lord Jesus is here. Amen. Amen. And the table of bread is now to be made ready. It is the table of company with Jesus and all who love him. It is the table of sharing with the poor of the world with whom Jesus identified himself. It is the table of communion with the earth in which Christ became incarnate. So come to this table you who have much faith and you who would like to have more you who have been here often and you who have not been for a long time and you who have tried to follow Jesus and you who have failed come it is Christ who invites us to meet him here. Let us pray together. Loving God, through your goodness, we have this bread and wine grape juice to offer, which has come forth from the earth and human hands have made. May we know your presence in the sharing so that we may know your touch and presence in all things. We celebrate the life that Jesus shared among his community through centuries and shares with us now. May one in Christ and one with each other, we offer these gifts and with them ourselves, a single living act of praise let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord's table is ready, and I want to invite those who are uh, communion service to come forward. And we will do our communion today by intention. So we will have, you will have a piece of bread, and you will dip it in the cup, and as Pastor Frank said, you're invited to uh, place yourself 
in the rail here to be blessed uh, with oil on your forehead, also a time of prayer for you. And uh, God's table is ready. God's table is inviting you to come, to continue be transformed through your faith. An invitation that is always here for us to be part of every day of our lives. Thy faithfulness, O oh God, our Father, there is no shadow turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassion. No, they fell not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be great. Is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see all I have needed thy hand hath provided great is thy faithfulness Lord I to me oh, 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 oh. summer and winter and springtime ooh, and harvest sun moon and stars in their courses above. Join in all nature, ooh, in manifold, manifold witness to, to thy great faithfulness, mercy and love. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. Oh, all I have needed. Ooh, thy hand. Have provided great is thy faithfulness, Lord. I knew me.
Let us pray. Thank you, God, for this time. Thank you for the amazing ways that you invite us to your table, for the ways that your Holy Spirit continue to transform us. And we trust, God, of you, the amazing ways that you continue to move through our hearts. Make us be better. Help us have the desire in our hearts to continue to seek transformation. Heal us. Make us whole in you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Now I want to invite you to sing with me our last song, Waymaker. Aquí estás, debemos mover, te adoraré, te adoraré. Aquí estás, obrando en mí, te adoraré, te adoraré. Aquí estás, te vemos mover, te adoraré, te adoraré. Aquí estás, obrando en mí, te adoraré, te adoraré. Te cantamos milagroso, abres camino, cumples promesas, luz en tinieblas, mi Dios, así eres tú. Milagroso, abres camino, cumples promesas, luz en tinieblas, mi Dios, así eres tú. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you, I worship you. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, mending every heart. I worship you, Lord, I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the dark.
we believe in Jesus Christ we believe that he's the way maker that he's the miracle worker that he will continue to transform our hearts that we will continue to help us share the love of Christ with our neighbors that he will help us to bless this neighborhood amen he will bless us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ aunque no pueda ver está sobrando aunque no pueda ver está sobrando siempre estás siempre está sobrando siempre estás siempre está sobrando aunque no pueda ver está sobrando aunque no pueda ver está sobrando siempre estás siempre está sobrando siempre estás siempre está sobrando aunque no pueda ver está sobrando aunque no pueda ver está sobrando siempre estás siempre está sobrando siempre estás siempre está sobrando aunque no pueda ver está sobrando aunque no pueda ver está sobrando siempre estás siempre está sobrando siempre estás siempre está sobrando milagroso Abres camino, cumples promesas, luz en tinieblas, mi Dios, así eres tú. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Milagroso, Camino, cumples promesas, luz en tinieblas, mi Dios, así eres tú. We believe it, right? We make her miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. That is who you are. Así tú, así eres tú, así eres tú. Thank you, Pastor Rose Denny. At, at some point, I just stopped singing and was just listening to her. She's, <laughs> she's such a gift. Uh, so we go out into the world of which Jesus is still weeping. The brokenness, the hate, the violence, it breaks the Lord's heart. Yet we have been, hopefully, touched by the Lord, experienced the Lord's love, nourished by the table of the Lord, perhaps receiving oil, and we smell great, right? Doesn't the fragrance of God smell great? The Old Testament says that about offering, right? The smell reached the Lord and the Lord was pleasing. And so we go forth now, sent into the community to bless the Lord and those around us. We go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.